Hey guys, welcome back and Happy New Year! One of you guys requested this topic and it just so happens that I am so interested in it. So, let's get into it. Have you ever experienced irrational fear upon having to be vulnerable in front of someone? Or maybe you've experienced an overwhelming need to avoid intimacy at all costs because it feels suffocating. Does giving or receiving affection scare the living hell out of you? And do you know what the most common love triangle actually looks like? We've already lightly tapped into the importance of relationships and the effect that they have on our well-being and our happiness. The question I want to look at today is why? Why do we attach to people and what ways are there to attach? Are we even attaching in the healthiest possible manner? And what role does our ego play in the romantic game? Key ingredients such as intimacy, trust, authenticity and vulnerability are great, but so many people have really severe difficulty in deploying these tools and there's a very, very good reason for that. Secure quality attachments defined as having experienced consistent, loving, reliable and warm care in infancy will contribute significantly to our ability to form intimate and trusting relationships as adults. The capacity to form a bond or in other words attach is definitely not restricted to humans and this is what Harlow found in the late 1950s. He was very interested in the topic. It wasn't ethical to conduct his experiments with human babies and their mothers. It was, however, ethical to conduct these experiments with monkeys. So he found that the wild-caught monkeys, the macaques, were found to be carrying disease and therefore the babies had to be separated from their mothers shortly after birth and kept alone in cages. Harlow found that the babies would cling to the soft sanitary sheet that was used to line their cage and they would also squeal in protest anytime they had to be taken out in order for the cage to be cleaned or the sanitary sheet to be replaced. So it looks like in substitution for their mothers, the babies would actually form sort of like a surrogate relationship or attachment to the closest possible comfort available. And even though the babies had all of their physiological needs met, they had a clean shelter, they had access to food and water. The one thing that they didn't have, which was the warm emotional care, seemed to be more important than a reliable source of food. You know how in the middle of the 20th century, I mean, not that you know from <laughs> personal experience, but we all know that in the middle of the 20th century, it was common practice to encourage mothers to not overindulge their babies with care and to rather get them in a very strict feeding and sleeping routine as quickly as possible. So it was believed that picking up a baby on demand when it was distressed was actually spoiling the baby. Harlow's research was actually supported by another psychologist around the same time who argued that any separation from the mother or the primary caregiver is damaging to a child's ability to form trusting and loving relationships in adult life. Eric Erickson in the 60s actually argued that our ability to form these relationships is strongly dependent on different stages of early development, with the first year of our lives being the most crucial one because this is when we're the most helpless, we are the most dependent. I mean, we literally can't even support our own heads. So we really are dependent on other human beings to meet our basic survival needs. So Eric claims that if as children we were fed, kept warm and dry and we were comforted reliably and consistently when we were distressed, then chances are we're going to grow up as relatively optimistic adults. If, however, we were neglected or the care that we received was unpredictable, inconsistent and unreliable, then this is going to result in a very pessimistic view of life as adults 
and it's also going to affect our ability to trust people which as we all know is a vital ingredient to falling in love so from all of this we can totally assume that developing the confidence that our needs will be met while we're children is going to affect how we see the world as adults securely attached children simply learn to accept that they are loved and cared for and this very knowledge gives them the capacity to form the same secure relationship once they're fully grown up the silver lining in all of this is that there is evidence to show that emotional damage in childhood can actually be repaired with a strong, loving, and secure adult relationship. This is where it gets juicy. It would be wrong to assume that everyone can work on their relationship skills or indeed can have a relationship to begin with. This is because the very idea of allowing emotions to come to the surface and being open and vulnerable in front of someone leaves some people way too fragile for comfort. In the late 70s, Ainsworth, who is a well-known psychologist, distinguished between three main types of mothering. Adults that were raised in a particular attachment style are very likely to find their own style of loving and attaching as adults to reflect the kind of response that they got as children. Starting with the secure attachment, this is obviously where the relationship is loving, warm, there is intimacy, confidence, it's relatively issue-free. We have the avoidant attachment style, which is where there is a lack of acceptance of others, there is an avoidance of closeness and intimacy. And this is where you're highly likely to be finding faults with all the people that you meet just so that you can avoid the intimacy and the closeness that could possibly arise if you were to form a relationship with them. The anxious or ambivalent attachment style is where you can see dependency, insecurity in terms of lack of appreciation, this is where people can become very paranoid. It's very likely to experience a difficulty with the relationship. We have the fearful attachment, a conscious desire for forming a relationship. However, the person nevertheless remains terrified of the consequences. So they're very, very nervous. Even though they want to be in a relationship, they can never quite be at ease with being in a relationship. And we have the dismissive attachment style, which is where you're likely to choose to remain single. <laughs> there is a defensive denial of the need to form a relationship. And if you do find yourself in a relationship one way or another, chances are there are going to be some difficulties. So, now that you know all of this, and before I tell you about the most common love triangle that you can find yourself in, what attachment style do you guys think you have? I personally lean towards the fearful avoidant. Let me know in the comments down below. Most of us have probably been in a conventional love triangle at least once. All of us have undoubtedly at some point been a part of the most common love triangle, which is between you, your partner, and ego. If attachment styles are one way of communicating with your partners, then another way of doing that is through ego states. Or in other words, this is where the theory of transactional analysis becomes very, very relevant. According to this theory, at any one time, we're interacting with others in one out of three states. We have the parent, the child, or the adult. The child is obviously dependent. It needs advice, care, and guidance provided by a parent. The parent is the dominant character. They tend to make decisions for others, and they typically look after the child that is in their care. And the adult, of course, is independent, secure, 
they make their own decisions and they take responsibility for their actions. In other words, very, very often we don't act like adults in our relationships and we very often adopt either the parent state where we try to patronize our partners or we accept the child state where we become martyrs. When we adopt an inappropriate role, there's two options. Either we create conflict, inevitably, or we force the other person to play an inappropriate role too. If at any point the second partner refuses to be forced into adopting an inappropriate state and chooses to adhere to acting like an adult, this is 100% going to result in conflict too. And this is because the second partner is effectively refusing to be patronized or to be mothered. So let's look at all the possible variations of these roles and how can you possibly find harmony? There's only one way. If both people are adopting the parent state, we're gonna have conflict. If one is acting like a parent and the other one refuses to act like a child and instead acts like an adult, we're gonna have conflict. If one acts like a parent and the other one is forced into the child state, we have a dominant relationship. If both people are acting like adults, we have harmony. If both people are acting like children, of course we have conflict. And if one person is acting like the child and they successfully force their partner into becoming the parent, then we have a martyr sort of relationship. Put very simply, the idea behind transactional analysis and ego states is that a lot of our communication is entirely based on unconscious re-experiencing of events from our past. I'm sure we can all appreciate that there is room for quite a lot of emotional baggage with memories resurfacing from childhood, with previous relationships being dragged around. The adult state is absolutely the most appropriate one and the one that we should all be aiming for but it can get very, very hard and I totally understand that. If, for example, your partner likes to raise their voice at you or maybe even shout every once in a while, adopting the adult state would sound something like this. I don't like it when you shout at me. It makes me feel threatened and unhappy and I want you to stop. The adult state is assertive, it's open, it's honest, it doesn't have a personal agenda and it seeks mutual benefit. So, knowing all of this now, knowing your own attachment style and the different ways that we can become the child or the parent in our relationship, can you think of a moment that you experienced an inappropriate ego state? And how did it go? I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I absolutely love this topic. Leave me a comment down below with your thoughts. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!